Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ryan Bijan, host of Cowtown Movie Classics. And if you're just joining us this evening, we are presenting a double feature of two Technicolor terrors for Warner Brothers Pictures in the early 1930s. Tonight, our second guest of the evening is prolific writer, film historian, audio commentator, and a very good friend, Mr. David DelVal. How's it going, David? Hey, Ryan. Well, happy Friday the 13th. We're recording this on Friday the 13th, so I'm all stoked for it. And what better way to start any Friday the 13th but with a mysterious wax museum with kind of suspicious exhibits of very lifelike figures. Both The Mystery of the Wax Museum and House of Wax are the same movie. One is a remake of the other. Uh, I was a child when House of Wax came out, and uh, in fact, I was like three years old. And so I have a very, it's one of the first horror movies I ever saw. My mother took me in to see it. And I remember you go into the theater and because it was 3D, if you didn't have your glasses on, everything was blue and red. Yeah. Now, Mystery of the Wax Museum was a very hard movie to see when I was growing up because it was considered a lost film. It was discovered in Jack L. Warner's personal library at Warner Brothers. Then a print was struck and the rest is history. We wouldn't be watching Mystery of the Wax Museum today if Jack Warner hadn't kept a copy of it for himself. And of course, with all the preservationists like William K. Everson uh, and Curtis Harrington and people like that, these movies were, we were looking for them, you know. But Mystery of the Wax Museum is a Technicolor marvel. Lionel Atwell. When you see Lionel Atwell, the villain you love to hiss, he made a career of playing these very perverse and diabolical mad scientists and, and leering sex fiends, which pre-code allowed him to do. So let's watch Mystery of the Wax Museum 1933 with the fabulous Lionel Atwell and his leading lady, Faye Ray, who was on her way to meet the tallest, darkest leading man in movies, King Kong. All right, thank you so much, David. If you're in the audience, please stick around after the show so you can hear the rest of our conversation where we really dig deep into the behind the scenes life of Mr. Lionel Atwill. So without further ado, from 1933, also starring the always wonderful Glenda Farrell, Mystery of the Wax Museum. For a movie that's 90 years old, I say that's still pretty exciting and riveting, don't you? Well, you know, the fact that, uh you do feel a little sympathy for Atwell. I think the fact that in both versions, this sculptor, you know, his, his intentions are the best. He's just an artist and he's kind of forestalling doing the Chamber of Horrors. But once he's burnt, it becomes, and the scenes in the, uh, in the morgue, you know, I, I have to tell you, every movie that has a morgue or a, a, a morgue attendant in it, he always keeps his lunch in one of the drawers. <laughs> have you ever seen a morgue, a morgue attendant that wasn't eating something? And it goes no matter what decade, if you do Jack the Ripper in the 1880s or New York in the 30s or even the Night Stalker with Darren McGavin, always the, the undertaker has his lunch in a freezer with a body because that's supposed to be kind of gallows humor. But that's, I think, a good description of Mystery of the Wax Museum. It's gallows humor with a very, very fine cast. Everyone in it, Glenda Farrell, Faye, well, Faye Ray wasn't a Broadway star, but Lionel Atwell was an enormous Broadway star. He was absolutely celebrated in the late 20s. By 1930, 1931, when he started coming to Hollywood, he was paid like $2,000 a week in, in depression money to play these parts. And the other thing about Lionel Apple around this time, he was married to a very celebrated woman. He was married to Henrietta Louise MacArthur. Yeah, that's right, General, General MacArthur's wife. And she famously said when she divorced the general to marry Lionel Atwell, I'm trading in five, I'm trading in five little stars for one big one. Oh, wow. And their marriage lasted just a few, not very long, maybe four, four or five years at the most, because she married a very strange man. She married a man that liked to party. She married a man that liked to uh, indulge in exotic tastes, to be kind of vague about it. And he encouraged this reputation. So Lionel Atwell's performances were always tinged with a little bit of sexual perversity, 
in a heterosexual way and very uh, sadistic. If you see him in uh, Ruben Malmulian's Song of Songs, his the wedding night in that is equal to a horror movie. And the only actor that really was his rival was Basil Rathbone. Basil Rathbone was a huge star on Broadway and a huge star in Hollywood. And of course, the two would work together in Roland B. Lee's Son of Frankenstein, which really established, established Lionel Atwell's uh, reputation as one of the leading horror stars of the 20, of the 30s and 40s, because he, his, his inspector in that who gets his arm ripped off, his artificial arm, is yeah. like, one doesn't forget, Herr Baron, an arm being taken out by the roots. And, and of course, Lugosi, every, Son of Frankenstein, even though it's not James Whale, is a brilliant movie, tremendous set decoration, photography, everything. About it. And Bela Lugosi giving one of the great performances of his career, proving beyond a doubt that he wasn't just Dracula. He was just as good an actor as Karloff. And I've always said this, maybe a little more exotic, but what's wrong with that? Right. Um, but Mystery of the Wax Museum, oh, the one thing about it is that in both movies, they play up the unmasking scene as if it's the equivalent of the Phantom of the Opera. The problem is with both of these movies, the Mystery and House of Wax, you see him out of makeup right away. That makeup is no surprise to anyone. And so I don't understand why everyone refers to, to Fay Ray breaking the, the and, and uh, uh, Phyllis Kirk breaking the mask away. I mean, for her, it was a shock in the House of Wax. And it's still, I guess it's a shock for the 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 ingenue being, being you know, menaced. But the audience has seen that burnt makeup before, haven't they? Right, well, it's interesting because the movie plays it like they're two different characters. And maybe if you're seeing them for the first time, you don't quite make the connection. Even though in House of Wax, it's clearly Vincent Price under the makeup. I think in Mystery of the Wax Museum, Atwell's features are a little more obscured. So maybe by well, that point in the movie, you don't make the connection. Well, in this great book by my friend Gregory William Mank, Hollywood's Maddest Doctors, I recommend this to anyone that loves these three actors, Colin Clive, Lionel Atwell, and George Zuko, the man with the kaleidoscope. I love George Zuko. In fact, it's like Zuko and Atwell both played Professor Moriarty in the Sherlock Holmes movies. Zuko in Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, it's brilliant, brilliant. And uh, Lionel Atwell in The Secret Weapon is also great. It's not the same, it doesn't have the same great script as the one at Fox. But he does get to say the seventh, he does get to bring up Holmes's cocaine addiction. Ah, the needle to the end, Holmes. So that was, and that's in the 40s, so that the, the censors didn't get into that. But I wanted to read you because Lionel Atwell made a lot of comments about his uh, his style of acting. And uh, I wanted to give you a couple of them because, uh, uh, oh, yes, here he talks about his mental cruelty. My wife tells me that I am cruel and that I have a streak of cruelty. And what I do, I do when I'm cruel. Nothing, nothing to do. Nothing is the most blood curdling thing of all. So if you don't think this guy was perverse and he would refer to women that would be attracted to him, he said, ah, women are like cats. First, you give them a bowl of cream and then they'll do what you want. I mean, you couldn't say any of this stuff now, but what a guy, what a guy. And all of his performances were fascinating. And when I was a little boy and I was very attracted to the bizarre and the flamboyant, Lionel Atwell and George Zuko were my go-to guys. And yeah. both of them in universal horror. Lionel Atwell in Man-Made Monster, where he gets to say the famous line to the woman strapped to the operating table, think of it, my dear, I offer you eternal life. And George Zuko, who in The Mad Ghoul, I mean, to be a ghoul anyway, to be mad, I mean, my God. But The Mad Ghoul is George Zuko at his best because he's got the hots for uh, Evelyn Anchors which is kind of disturbing and she's kind of oblivious to it and he, he creeps up behind her and he goes my dear you need to you need to read the book of love and you need a man that can teach you how to read it and if she doesn't get the idea what he's up to there then she deserves what happens to her anyway uh so universal kind of had a great roster of character actors 
And but let's not forget Glenda Farrell in Mystery of the Wax Museum. Now, remember, at the time this movie came out on Broadway, the the front page, Broadway plays about the newspaper industry were big. And Glenda Farrell and Lee Tracy, the stars of both these Michael Curtiz directed movies, were skilled beyond words at playing these newspaper types. Quick clip dialogue, kind of raunchy humor, and a great sense of, of one-upmanship, you know, and the banter between the two. Lee Tracy would go on to give one of the great performances in Gore Vidal's The Best Man. If you want to see Lee Tracy at the end of his career giving a, an Academy Award winning performance, he plays the president of the United States in Gore Vidal's The Best Man with Henry Fonda. And he's brilliant. And Glenda Farrell, you know, all these actors, both of them gave great performances right through the 30s. But these movies, Dr. X and Mystery of the Wax Museum, are really classics. Dr. X is one of the most, it's one of the creepiest, and I think one of the finest of the uh, pre-code. And pre-code is a whole, we could do a whole series on pre-code because Lionel also did Murders in the Zoo. My, 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 we must do Murders in the Zoo time. That's great opening. One of the truly pre-code openings in the jungle. And the Vampire Bat, which was made right after this, where he works with Dwight Fry, who played Renfield in Dracula. Uh, Lionel Atwell did it all. And then he ended his career. He died in 1946. And he had a son that he never saw. Uh, and Lionel Atwell Jr. was around for a long time doing horror conventions. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lionel Atwell's ashes remained in the mortuary here in Los Angeles for years and years and years until they found the son and he was finally able to be buried. So there's a whole, and it's all in, in Greg Mank's book about Lionel Atwell. If you look at the universal horror films of the early 1930s, they have a much more gothic, outwardly expressionistic feel. But then you look at something like Dr. X, Mystery of the Wax Museum, these films are so visually distinct and they take on a much more kind of contemporary art deco flavor, don't they? Well, they do. I mean, the the sets by Anton Grote could easily go into German expressionism or uh, an art deco, remember, was part of around the time of The Mummy, 1932. Mm -hmm. The Tutankhamun exhibit had swept the world and Egyptian uh, artifacts became great decorator items. So Art Deco, which was already flourishing in the 30s, and Art Nouveau, which is more Baroque, they kind of fused. And with a movie like Spingali with John Barrymore, you see the Anton Grote sets, which were also prevalent in something like Murders in the Rue Morgue, the, the original that Robert Flory directed, where the rooftops and everything harken back to the days of the Golem and the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Remember though, all the exact, all the guys that were in Hollywood that were running studios were emigres from, from Germany. You know, you, we had uh, uh, Fritz Lang coming over. We had, you know, uh, Marlena Dietrich and Joseph von Sternberg and uh, um, all of the, uh, you know, the artisans that left Ufa, those that remained, you know, people like Peter Lorre and Conrad Veidt. Conrad Veidt, of course, was in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and a number of very key horror movies of the 20s. But the art direction in both evokes both the, the, the expressionism of another time and the art deco of today. When you see the clock, New Year's Eve, you know, it's very nice, but it's also, Mystery of the Wax Museum really tries to straddle the line between a horror film and a newspaper movie like the front page. And it's impossible not to get that connection because of Glenda Farrell, you know, who's continually quitting her job. And obviously, un-PC as hell, she's like sleeping with her boss or threatening not to sleep with her boss, depending on where her job is. <laughs> so that's there. And, you know, there are moments in Dr. X where, you know, for example, if you compare House of Wax to Mystery of the Wax Museum, in Mystery of the Wax Museum, Edward uh, Arthur Edmund Carew is a drug addict. His character in House of Wax is an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we're we're still in the 50s was almost as bad as as the uh the period from 36 to, to, to 39 when the code was enforced 
yeah. where married couples slept in separate beds and everyone pretended to live a life that didn't exist. That right. never existed. That never existed ever. But yet course, yeah. the whole family unit didn't exist. I mean, were there people that lived happily like that? Perhaps, but you know, it certainly wasn't like the movies depicted it. But right. Well, I'm I'm glad that you brought up House of Wax. Now, um, as our viewers may know, you had a very close friendship with Vincent Price. Did he ever talk about the influence of Lionel Atwell or this earlier version? Well, he worked with Atwell. In fact, uh, all these people knew each other. Lionel Atwell directed Basil Rathbone on Broadway. Uh, Lionel Atwell went to see Victoria Regina with Hel Helen Hayes and Lionel Atwell starred on Broadway before Vincent Price was in movies. So Lionel Atwell knew them all, worked with them. All. Lionel Atwell was an enormous star. And when he was married to MacArthur's ex, he was, there wasn't anyone in the business he didn't know. He met the rich, the famous, he knew them all, knew them all. And uh, he worked with John Barrymore at the very end of his career. Lionel Atwell's career at Universal worked, he worked right up until he died in 1946. But uh, the point is, Vincent has always said, he said it on my TV show that I did with him. He, he said, House of Wax changed my life. He said at the time he was making, was offered House of Wax, he was also offered a Broadway play called We're No Angels, which was on Broadway. Now the movie of We're No Angels is Basil Rathbone and Humphrey Bogart. The play did nothing for the people in it. So he did write in choosing House of Wax because it, House of Wax finally did what Dragon Wick started. It gave Vincent Price a career in horror films. But remember, House of Wax was 1953. Vincent Price would not be a full-fledged horror icon until 1960. But in 1958, he did The Fly. From House of Wax to The Fly to House of Usher, and actually from House of Wax to The Fly to House on Haunted Hill to House of Usher. That was the trajectory that Vincent's horror stardom rose on. But he knew that with Wax, he had the opportunity to do the two things he does best, which is to straddle the line between artistic genius and homicidal rage. He played the artist when pushed. The Mad Magician is just a, a rehearsal for House of Wax. Well, actually House of Wax opened the door for The Mad Magician. And Vincent was then to have done Phantom of the Rue Morgue, which was like a kind of remake of uh, Murders in the Rue Morgue. But uh, we were in the middle of the McCarthy era. And Vincent was labeled a communist and his career was destroyed for about six months, six to eight months. He was gray listed and the FBI came to his house and they had a long conversation. Like most actors, Vincent joined a lot of things in the late 30s and 40s that were political, but they're like the strike right now. Vincent joined because it was actors against this and that. He didn't know it was the Communist Party. And so what if it was, you know? Actors have no power, really, in politics. They think they do, but, you know, Ronnie Reagan proved that, you know, if you don't marry the right evil woman, you'll never get it. Anyway, I don't want to get into yeah, that. Sure. But, but the thing is, uh, Vincent was very aware. Also, Vincent mentioned that it was the one and only time he saw Bela Lugosi in a tuxedo, you know, looking wonderful three years before his death because Bela was invited by Warner Brothers to go down for the opening of House of Wax in Los Angeles. And he went with Charlie Gamora on a chain as an ape. And Richard Denning and Evelyn Ankers from the, from the Wolfman, they were all there. And uh, Vincent had been in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein as a voice actor playing the Invisible Man. Of course, he'd been the Invisible Man and in Invisible Man Returns. So they all knew each other. But uh, Vincent was very um, protective of Bela Lugosi. And many years later, when people would ask why Vincent never tried to play Dracula, well, he was not, it would have been, you know, Vincent Price is not my, he's not a Dracula, right? He could be a vampire as he did in the Monster Club. But he said, I always, it said that on my show, I always defer to Bela Lugosi, you know? And then of course, when he worked with Christopher Lee, he and Vincent, no, Christopher Lee and Vincent, I don't think Vincent ever asked him about Dracula. But I think Christopher Lee asked Vincent of what he thought of Lugosi. And Vincent said, well, we were waiting for a vampire that didn't have on a full suit of clothes when he was resurrected. Because Vincent saw Dracula, Prince of Darkness. 
and he died laughing when Christopher's hand comes out of the coffin and he's naked. He said, oh my God, he has to get his clothes on before we can see. He just took it to the, you know, he just thought that was hysterical. And of course, when he told that to Christopher Lee, he and Christopher Lee had a great relationship because you can't be pompous around this. That I told you earlier regarding some mutual people we know. Pomposity is something I just have to stick a pen in the minute I'm around it, regardless to the consequences, because I just find it intolerable. You know, if you don't have a sense of humor, you're just not going to make it through this world. And, but you know, Lionel Atwell, really, I just hope more people will watch his movies because all of the murders in the zoo is fabulous. Uh, the Vampire Bat, you know, Song of Songs, House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, he's a policeman in that. But uh, Man Made Monster, which would have been a, was originally a movie for Karloff Lugosi. They just dusted the script off and Lon Chaney Jr. In fact, it was Man Made Monster that gave Lon Chaney Jr. the Wolfman. Yeah. So Atwell was there for the beginning and ends of everyone's career. But then his life took a turn for the worse in 1945, right after the war, when it got out these two kind of questionable girls you know, girls that were hanging, were not, you know, Hollywood always had these women that would come into town looking, you know, just short of prostitution, looking for wanting to get in the movies any way they could. And people need to realize that, that even today, there are men and women, young men and women, attractive young women and men that come to Hollywood looking for people to have sex with to get in show business, which is rather awkward right now because we're in a time when you get canceled for that. But it's still going on. And Lionel Atwell, they went to trial because he was accused of showing pornography and that blue movies on a, on a 16 millimeter projector in his home on Amalfi Drive in the Pacific Palisades. He went to court, he was exonerated, but his career was pretty much over and he died the next, he died in 1946 after making a serial at Universal called Lost City of the Jungle. And uh, it was a sad kind of conclusion to a glorious career. But don't feel sorry for him because, I mean, it was a terrible way to end. But he had a very young wife, a baby that was, in fact, his son was born a month before he died. So he never really got like, like um, Clark Gable he never or Humphrey Bogart. They never saw their sons. Yeah. Um, so Atwell's career was was wonderful. It was a skyrocket. It was it was Broadway theater. It was movies. It was everything. And he's, we're talking about him 75 years after the fact. Yeah. But, but, you know, sex scandals, well, Errol Flynn couldn't have made movies today. You know, because these people were living with the studio system protecting them. You know, whatever happened in Hollywood stayed in Hollywood. But that's not the case now. But if we'd had the internet in the 30s, I don't know what. <laughs> it would yeah. have been a whole different world. But uh, House of Wax had the advantage of being in 3D. But if you think about it, a movie in three strip, strip Technicolor in 1933 would have been an, it would have been a gimmick too, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, I think that's what's great about both House of Wax and Mystery of the Wax Museum. I think they're genuinely good films, even despite the gimmicks. They still work on their own, even if they were in black and white or in 2D. Oh, yeah. No, as a matter of fact, I introduced House of Wax here in Los Angeles at the Alex Theater with a 2D print. And I was furious because the whole point to seeing it in an audience in a theater is to wear those glasses. But, you know, they liked it nonetheless. So it works, you know, uh, Mad Magician's 2D as well. They show it in both versions. Yeah. And Mad Magician is the sequel, the un un unauthorized sequel to House of Wax. Yeah. Well, David, thank you so much for your time. Do you have any closing thoughts on Mystery of the Wax Museum? Well, first of all, I think with all of us being so aware of film preservation, let's just always be grateful for the fact that these movies were preserved, even if it was by the head of the studio, and that that's one more reason. House of Wax, Mystery of the Wax Museum, Dr. X, Island of Lost Souls, all these movies, Old Dark House, the original, were all in danger of being lost to time. We still have a lot of movies, so London After Midnight being the most famous. But uh, my closing thoughts are uh, Lionel Atwell and Vincent Price are immortal in not just cinema, but in the horror cinema. And you're doing your part to make sure that people enjoy them in the best way possible, which is to see them on the big screen. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I certainly appreciate that. Mr. David DelVal, once again, thank you so much for your time.
Well, my pleasure, Brian. See you again soon. All right, and you're in the audience. I hope you enjoyed this wonderful evening of two fabulous, rarely seen horror masterpieces. Once again, my name is Ryan Bijan. We'll see you next time.